All right, we are a minute after, so uh, we'll go ahead and get this started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Kyle Boyer and I'll be your host for today. Um, welcome to the October edition of Cannes Journal Club. Today, we're gonna be discussing heavy metals in cannabis and the latest development and testing protocols. And I'm joined here by Dr. Jenny Nelson. Um, and she'll be talking about her uh, AOAC first action method, as well as some of her efforts towards uh, developing an ASTM method. And I'll give a little bit about Dr. Nelson. So uh, Dr. Nelson received her PhD in analytical chemistry from the University of Cincinnati in 2007 and her MBA from St. Mary's College of California in 2011. Currently, Jenny is an application scientist at Agilent Technologies, joining in 2000, and she joined in 2012. Uh, Jenny is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Viticulture and Enology at the University of California, Davis since 2013. She's been very active with AOAC and ASTM over the past eight years, serving on expert review panels, chairing committees, and volunteering to develop new methods needed by the industry. Jenny has extensive experience in operating and method development for uh, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, ICPMS, which we'll be talking about today, uh, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectroscopy, so ICP-OES, as well as uh, microwave plasma atomic uh, emission spectroscopy, MPAES. Uh, Jenny, we're really pleased to have you today and really looking forward to learning a bit more about your methods. All right, thank you, Kyle. Okay, so I'm going to um, share my screen here, and we did a test, so we know that it works. Okay, presenter mode. All right. Okay, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, hopefully there's a mix of metals and non-metals people, but everybody's interested in learning about um, metals and cannabis, because uh, that's what we're talking about. So today I'm going to talk about heavy metals and cannabis and the latest developments in testing protocols. And I've been um, very involved with the um, testing protocols for heavy metals and cannabis for the last few years. Um, I've been working with mostly AOEC and more recently ASTM to develop some of these um, new testing protocols for heavy metals and cannabis. So why is metals analysis important for cannabis? Well, it's not just the plant, actually. Most people think of doing uh, metal testing for the actual cannabis plant, but it's actually more than that. And we get a lot of requests from um, cannabis um, customers that they're also interested in looking at metals in maybe their irrigation water, the fertilizers, and the nutrients that they add to the plants, also the soil, because obviously these are plants, so cannabis plants can uptake a lot of metals and minerals that are in the soil up into the plants. Um, so they want to know that soil before planting cannabis in it. Also, um, ingredients that are used in some of the edible products, uh, oils, extracts, and concentrates. Uh, some of the delivery devices, you might have been hearing a lot uh, recently about things, testing and method development around some of these um, devices that people are using these days, and also vaporizers. So you can see there's a long list of things that people are interested in um, testing metals for. So um, most people know that in the cannabis industry, the big four metals, and these are the same big four metals that are uh, play a big role in a lot of the food testing as well. And these are commonly known as the big four, the toxic um, elements, and those are arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead. And those get most of the um, attention in the cannabis industry, since those are known to be the most toxic, you know, carcinogenic compounds. And so they get a lot of attention, but there are other heavy metals that are found in nature that could also be potential sources of contaminations for cannabis and cannabis derived products, like some of them that we talked about earlier, like the edibles, um, and actually in, in many of the things that people are consuming these days. And some of those metals that are of interest that are beyond the big four are nickel, vanadium, cobalt, copper, selenium, boron, thallium, barium, antimony, silver, gold, zinc, tin, manganese, moly, tungsten, iron, and uranium. And those are just some of the ones that we hear from our customers that they're interested in testing. However, a lot less work and studies have been done looking at those heavy metals versus the big four. And so there's a lot of things that uh, still need to be studied, and we still need to know the toxicity of some of those um, heavy metals, and also how they're existing in the plants. So um, 
based on maybe we want to know what their oxidation state is or if they're in the organic or inorganic form and those are just some of the um, examples okay so um, plants pick up nutrients which we already um, briefly talked about in that they come through the root system um, in order to grow and develop and many of these elements can play different roles for the plants they can be either essential beneficial or detrimental to the cannabis plant and some of the detrimental heavy metals are those big four like we just said like lead cadmium um, arsenic and mercury but also added to that list is chromium and then we also have essential plant nutrients and these really help the plants grow and those some of those are zinc manganese iron copper and nickel and then um, some that are beneficial to plant nutrients would be, uh, one example would be cobalt. Okay, here is a list of, um, I think the most up-to-date list we have so far, and these are constantly changing. And as states come on board with their new regulations and states that previously um, had regulations but are updating them and changing them, um, this is the most current list that we have today. Although, you know, maybe tomorrow something, some of these numbers will change. But you can see we have quite a few um, states listed here. So you can see the top of the columns, you can see some of the states. And then along the side, I'm not sure if you see my cursor or not. Let me get my little pointer, um, laser pointer. So you can see the states up here on the top. And then the analyze of the elements of interest um, down the rows right here. And you can see the big four. So most every single state has um, that do have regulations have regulations for our big four, arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. And then we have this like additional, or uh, we'll call it the additional elements right now. So chromium, barium, silver, selenium, antimony, copper, nickel, and zinc. So there's some states that have started to have regulations for these additional elements. Um, and you can see right here, uh, Maryland did, I think I'm, this might not be the most current Maryland ones. I've heard there's been some changes for Maryland, um, but you can see for Michigan, they have some listed here in New York. So again, this, this list is always changing and it's hard to keep up to date with uh, everyone since this is state by state. You can also see that some states, they change the regulations based on the type of product. So you can see some things are um, highlighted in blue and that would be for um, inhaled products. Uh, yellow would be for final products orange would be oral, and then green would be topical. So it just depends on the product in the state, what their regulations are. One state that I did want to point out, that was is Michigan. And this is a, a newer regulations, I believe. And you can see on top of the big four elements, so the lead, mercury, cadmium, and arsenic, we actually have Michigan calling out inorganic arsenic. And this was actually a surprising thing to me. And that's because inorganic arsenic needs to be tested um, doing speciation analysis. And I'm not gonna talk about speciation analysis, but I've done it for many, many years and we could have a whole hour talk just on speciation in order to determine the inorganic arsenic level. Because most of these methods that people are doing are total methods like total concentration methods. So we're looking at the total amount of arsenic and not necessarily the inorganic or the organic forms of arsenic. So this was very surprising. And um, I'm not even sure the Michigan um, officials that uh, set this and if they know that this would actually be two different methods um, if you need to determine inorganic arsenic versus just regular arsenic. Um, but it's not surprising because inorganic arsenic is known to be, it's the most carcinogenic form of arsenic and it's the the form that's most regulated in the food space. So this would be for like right now, um, baby food has inorganic arsenic levels that are in uh, Congress right now. And there's uh, different levels of inorganic arsenic for juices and rices and many things. Okay, but also added to this list that I wanted to point out was the, the nickel and the copper. And the copper is just required for va vaping products. So you can see how it gets quite complicated if you're probably one of these labs that are testing for all these things and all the different um, levels that are allowed, depending on what state and depending on what product, it, it can be quite um, quite confusing. Okay, so a few years back, um, AOAC, which is one of the organizations that um, I've been working with or volunteering with to work on some method development, um, they got a cannabis group together. And then I would say over a year ago now, I'm not sure the exact date, um, they sent out a call for methods. And so this uh, call for methods was for all different cannabis um, methods. And one of them was for heavy metals. 
And so I've been working with AOEC for over a year now to work with them to get a method that met their cannabis expert um, uh, SMPR. So I'll share with you next what the SMPR is. So this is the SMPR. So this is a standard method performance requirement. So this group at AOEC, which is the cannabis experts, and this is comprised of a whole bunch of different people from government to industry, um, growers, you name it, lab people. There was This is a large group that came up with this, this um, performance requirement. So they set out and they said, we're looking for methods that will measure these heavy metals and the method has to meet these requirements. And you can see I have listed here on the um, right-hand side of the screen, the performance requirements for this method. So it's saying this method has to measure um, arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead, so the big four, but it also can have these optional elements, um, which was antimony, barium, chromium, copper, nickel, silver, selenium, and zinc. And that is because at the time that this SNPR was put out, two states, uh, which were New York and Maryland, those were the optional or the, the, their additional um, elements. So that's why that was what it was. And you can see down here below the method performance requirements. So for low level um, trace element testing, you can see it's uh, a little bit uh, easier effect, a little bit easier repeatability and re reproducibility and recovery uh, versus when you get to higher concentrations of these um, toxic elements in the, in the um, in the cannabis and cannabis derived products. Okay, so that's the requirements that we were working with for our method. And I had already been working on a, a metals and cannabis method in, for um, many, many years. So we just had to tweak our method so it met all these, these performance requirements. Okay, and so we just covered this. I went through that one already. So next we're gonna go to the samples. So we to do this um, study, we partnered with a microwave vendor. And that's because here at Agilent, we do a lot of the, the testing. So the ICPMS testing, the metals testing, but we were not experts in um, sample preparation. So in order to do sample preparation, we wanted to work with the experts in that. And in our case, we started to work with CEM and they're a vendor that makes microwave digestion products. And so what they do is they digest the sample to get it into a liquid form so that we can run it on one of our ICPMS instruments. And you can see here, we worked with AOEC and we wanted to get um, a good group of um, products that would cover that entire range of samples that they were looking to measure. So again, we're looking at the inhale, the oral, um, the topical, and the manufactured. So you can see we get a variety of different um, product, products here. So you can see for the oral, we, we looked at different pills or capsules, we looked at tinctures, and then we looked at edibles. And edibles had a variety of different types of products because we wanted the edibles, and we learned this from doing a lot of food testing, that you have to have like a food or in this case edibles that covered the kind of the food triangle. So things that had high fat, high protein, high carbohydrates, so that we could make sure that we could digest everything. Since it's kind of a, it's tricky to digest things maybe with high fat versus maybe high carbohydrate. And so CEM folks, they're experts in that and they, they really knew how to get everything into solution. And also I want, I want to point out that we wanted a method that could do all of these different types, all these different matrices in one method. We didn't want one method that was just for um, tinctures. We didn't want another method that was for edibles and another one that was just for cannabis flower plants. We wanted a method that could encompass everything and everything could be run in the same method. Because we know that in a lot of labs, they get you know hundreds, if not thousands, of samples to de a day, and for them to have you know ten different methods going on is just too confusing and um, too much extra work. So we wanted a catch-all method. So here are some of the topicals that we looked at. We looked at lotions, oils, and uh, uh, soap. And then for inhaled products, we looked at um, plant material, uh, vape pen cartridges, uh, so the CBD vape oil, and then the shatter. So we looked at some CBD shatter. And then for the manufacturing products, we looked at different biomasses, some crude extract, um, and then some refined extract, so some uh, distillate and some isolate. And then here is a picture of what the microwave instrument is that we that CEM used to digest all these samples. And since CEM is not on the call with me today, 
I'm going to play a video from um, Sam, who is the scientist that I worked with at CEM, and he is going to show you how he actually digested all of these different types of cannabis products. So Kyle and I tested this already. So let's make sure this works. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our lab. As we were talking about with our AOAC method, you can digest all of these different sample types using our one AOAC method. All right? We're going to be doing all of this in this Express Plus, Mars Express Plus digestion vessel. All right? It's a 24 place vessel using Teflon 110 mil vessels. They are a three piece assembly with a liner, a plug, and a cap. Right? So the liner holds the sample. The plug is for moderate, moderating pressure throughout the run, and the cap has a hole in it to allow for venting of gases. Now let's actually add some sample and show you guys how we do this. So you take your liner, and you will typically, for plant, plant material, we would usually use weigh paper, weigh boats. You want to make sure that you know, if you're using these types of things, you want to make sure that you're not running into static issues. So we may sometimes put our vessels in front of an anti-static ionizer like this. That really helps to stop your samples from sticking to the sides of the vessels or sticking to the uh, weight paper itself, right? A good technique for weight paper is to fold it in half. It makes it easier to dispense it into your vessels when the time comes. All right? And... There are a few other techniques that we like to use for you know some of the harder the smaller samples to put into your vessels like the uh, creams or the butters. We typically might use a plastic spatula like this. If you use any type of plastic uh, scrupulous or you know dispenseware, you want to make sure that you clean it beforehand using blue acid. For liquid samples, we like to use these pipe transfer pipettes. And again, you want to make sure you clean these beforehand using dilute acid, so 10% nitro will work great. All right, and make sure when you're adding these samples, you get the sample to the very bottom of the vessel. That is very important. You want to make sure that your sample is completely submerged in acid. All right, some of the concentrates and oils like to stick to the sides if you want to use these tools to make sure you get it to the bottom. All right. I've got some plant material conveniently already weighed out for me. This, well, first let me show you. The plant material, if it comes in my bag, it may not be very homogenous, right? You want to mix this bag up, tumble it a few times, shake it up a little bit, make sure that everything gets nice and homogenous in there. Otherwise, your stems might sit on top of everything and the shaky stuff will go to the bottom. You want to make sure you tumble it a few times and get it nice and homogenous before you sample it. And when you do sample it, don't just take all from one spot. Make sure you take a little bit from here, from there, and get a little bit of everything so that you get a nice representative sample. Alright, so we take our pre-weighed out sample and add it to the bottom of the vessel. Alright. Take this over to the hood and add acid. So, for our method, we call for nine mils of nitric and one mil of HCl. You can see here we have acid in glass bottles. We do not want to use acid in glass bottles. Glass is inherently dirty and it will contaminate your samples. So, we tend to use either our own distilled acid that comes in Teflon bottles, or you can order your own ultra pure, you know, reagent grade or trace metal grade acids from a few different sources. All right. So for adding the acid, we tend to use micro pipettes, just because we know the tips are clean and we know they're very accurate. Let me go ahead and add some acid. Now, once we've added our acid, we'll let it sit and pre-digest for up to 15, maybe even 30 minutes, depending on how reactive your sample is. 
If it's reacting at room temperature, it's a good idea to just go ahead and let pre-digest. If it's not, then you can just go ahead and seal it up and go. But for most of these cannabis and cannabis throughout products, they're gonna react. So just let them sit for at least 15 minutes. All right. One thing you'll notice here is, uh, actually I have some cannabis plant material already added to this tube with acid in here. This is 10 mils of acid. You can see, actually, that the plant material is creeping up out of the acid, right? That's not good. You want to make sure that it's submerged. So you might swirl it around it a little bit just to get it all mixed together so that it runs well. You see, it's nice and submerged. All right, what we do not want is to use too little acid because then it will all be spent during the reaction. You can see here, this is only three mils of acid. It's not going to completely submerge in three mils and you're going to run into problems and it's just not going to completely digest. So to get around that, we recommend using at least five mils of acid. We would prefer that you would use 10. All right, so now that we've got our sample pre-digested, let's go ahead and add our plug on top and then pour down our cap. If you gave this to five different lab workers, they would all torque it down, hand torque it down at five different, you know, five different pressures. So what we want to do is use our hand torquing device so that every vessel gets the same amount of torque. And what that'll do is prevent certain vessels from taking off and overreacting while they're still on. It'll make sure everything is nice and flat and reacts well together. All right. So now that we've got our vessel torqued, let's go ahead and put it into the turntable. Make sure it's nice and flush, and then we'll take it over to the microwave. All right, so we'll take our turntable, put it in the microwave. Shut the door. Then you have two different me uh, method directories to pick from. We're gonna pick the one-touch directory that comes with all of CEM's pre-programmed methods, and you'll find the cannabis one-touch method near the top, in the seeds, obviously. You press that method, and that's it. You hit start, and the unit will determine how many vessels you've got in there, what kind of vessels you're using, and how much power to apply so that you get there safely, right? So let's go ahead and look at the run history of a previous run of run. You can see here, the power starts off low, as does the temperature, which you would expect, and it slowly ramps it up to temperature. We call that ramp to temperature. It's a very safe way to get our samples all to temperature, you know, everything relatively at the same temperature and same pressure safely. So once we get to the end of the ramp, we're at 210 degrees, and you'll notice that the green line, the power there, is modulating to make sure that the red line, the power, or sorry, the temperature stays steady, all right? We want to hold it at 210 for 15 minutes. After that, the samples are digested. They'll go into a 15 minute cool down, and after the 15 minutes is up, you're able to pull them out and take a look at your digestions. Here I'll show you some of the result, uh, details of our run previously. We ran 14 vessels, and you can see here the check marks. That just shows that your, your sample made it a temperature. If you see any X's there, it'll also give you a temperature that that vessel reached, and that way you know, oh, my, temp my sample did not make it a temperature, that's why it did not digest really helpful tool. All right, so now that our samples are digested, let's pull them out of the microwave and take a look. All right, now that the reaction has subsided, there is still pressure in these vessels, right? We want to make sure we're safe when we open them. Again, there's a hole in the cap to allow fumes to vent out. You want to point that away from you and vent in a fume hood, right? Like this. You can see the gas is coming out of there. That's what you should expect. There will pretty much always be some type of pressure built up during the reaction. It's usually carbon dioxide and NOx gases that are formed. All right. Now that we've opened it up, we want to dilute this up. And the way you dilute it up matters. You don't want to use any type of glass. So the two different ways you can dilute it up are volumetrically and gravimetrically. If you're using gra oh, volumetrics, you want to make sure you use Teflon volumetrics that are pretty clean. You know, rinse them over a week in dilute acid before you use them. Don't just use reuse and reuse and reuse because you'll get contamination from your samples. All right. 
glued to the uh, line. This is a class A volumetric. We want to make sure you use type 1 ASTM water. Another way to dilute is gravimetrically, and this is what we use in our method. It tends to be more accurate. That's why we use it. You want to make sure you pre-soak these containers and dilute maybe 10%, 5% nitric acid for a day or two before you use them, just to make sure they're clean, even though we're pretty sure it's the ones we get are clean beforehand. So you'll pour your sample into there, and you want to quantitatively transfer. We typically do three rinses out of the liner and into the vessel, or and into the centrifuge tube. So obviously you'll have this container pre-teared before you add anything to it, so that you can dilute to weight. For our method, we dilute it to 50 mils using 10 mils of acid. You could get by again though with as little as five mils of acid, depending on your samples. All right, so three rinses. Just to make sure that we transfer everything, nothing stuck to the side. You want to make sure that you get everything out of there. All right, and then we'll take it over to the balance and dilute to 50 grams, and we're done. All right, so to recap, you can run all of these different samples. Our method encompasses all the different cannabis and cannabis derived products, including but not limited to plant material, foods, beverages consumer products, and manufacturing intermediates, right? So you can do all of these different samples using our Mars Express Plus vessel set. All right, if you want more tips and tricks on how to perhaps weigh your samples up, visit our uh, cm.com in the lab, cm.com in the lab for further tips and tricks. And I believe that's it. Okay. All right, so now that you know uh, the microwave digestion and how we get the samples into solution, um, which actually, to be honest with you, is really, really important because if the samples aren't digested correctly or they're not digested cleanly, um, we are never going to be able to see those trace um, level elements in the solution. So you have to really follow the advice that the sample preparation people give um, so that you have clean acids, clean containers, um, because we're looking for parts per billion um, metals in these solutions. So you can imagine if you don't have a very clean setup and a good way to do the digestion, you're never going to see that low. So that I can't emphasize enough how important that side of the analysis is. So after you get those clean samples, or you know, in a lot of people's labs, they're doing it themselves, then we take it over to our ICPMS. And in our case, for our method development for the AOAC and the ASTM methods, uh, we used a, a single quad ICPMS. In this case, it was an Agilent 7850 ICPMS, which is our newest single quad here at um, Agilent. Um, and since I work for Agilent, obviously we're using an Agilent instrument. Um, this instrument um, has a, a UHMI introduction system. So what that stands for is ultra high matrix introduction. And that allows us to run um, high matrices into the instrument. And you can see that for the cannabis type samples, this is possible that you're gonna have higher matrices um, versus uh, some other things that you're running. Like if you're looking at drinking water, for example, that's a very low matrix thing that you're putting into the instrument. But if you're looking at say some of those crude extracts of the cannabis or some of those isolates, it's, you're gonna have some pretty heavy matrices there. And by using this instrument, we're able to um, use preset settings. Um, in our case, we used a 4X UHMI setting so that we're able to run all the samples, all the different cannabis samples, all in one run. So that's super helpful. We also just use the standard um, SPS4 auto sampler, and then just a regular setup for everything else, like uh, the nebulizer, the spray chamber, the torch. Um, and then we use uh, regular um, cones. And then we use this thing called um, a collision reaction cell. And I can show you this in a second um, when I stop sharing my screen. But we use um, a collision reaction cell uh, and we use helium. We use helium gas in that collision reaction cell to do a kinetic energy discrimination. And what that does is it allows us to get rid of all of the polyatomic interferences that could be interfering with our elements of interest. So like arsenic, um, mercury, lead, cadmium, all of them, okay? So here I'm showing you some of our, we're gonna get into some of the data now. So 
this is an example of internal standard recovery. So we always pee in an internal standard so we know how the run is going throughout the course of the run. And you can see this, this run was um, almost 24 hours long and we have really good um, internal standard recovery. So within the 60 to 120 range recovery of our internal standards. So the internal standards are elements that we're not looking for, that again, we key in. So we have a sample stream of our actual samples and then we have a sample stream of an internal standard and those mix in a mixing tea and go to the instrument. And some of the elements that are used for the internal standard, you can see on the um, right-hand side here. So lithium, scandium, germanium, uh, rhodium, indium, there's a whole bunch. And these are things that we're not gonna find in the sample because you obviously can't have stuff that you're gonna find in the sample be used as an internal standard. We also do a lot of QC in our method. So this is an example of a CCV, so a cal uh, continuing calibra calibration verification. And this is just showing some recovery like within plus or minus um, uh, 20 for the elements of interest. So these are um, elements that we're looking for in our method. Here's just some examples of our calibration curve. And so these are the big four, arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. And you can see across the board, we had really good um, linearity across the whole calibration range. And here's some examples of some of those optional elements in our method. So vanadium, chromium, manganese, uh, cobalt, and nickel. All right, and obviously we have to run some SRMs, um, and this is a part of the AOEC SMPR requirements. So we looked at four different um, SRMs, and at the time of doing the AOEC method development, there was no uh, SRM standard reference materials for cannabis that were certified for metals. And so we had to use this other product. So these are like plant life, plant uh, types of um, products that we could use as substitutes because um, the matrix is pretty similar. So these are food products or food-like plants. So we looked at peach leaves, tomato leaves, pine needles, and apple leaves. And across the board, we um, were within the plus or minus 20% um, for the um, certified uh, elements. Okay, another thing that we had to do to meet the SMPR requirements was to do spikes. So we had to look at each of those different categories. So there was the um, topical, oral, manufactured, and uh, flowers. And we had to do different spike levels, so three levels of spikes low, medium, and high spikes for all the different elements in all the different matrices. So this was quite a lot of work, um, and we had to do everything in at least triplicates. So uh, this was lots of, lots of samples and lots of work, um, but here's a few of the results um, that I'll share with you. And I'm just going to share with you the big four because this would just be an um, overwhelming table of data um, if we looked at every, all the elements at one time. So this is a fortified method blank. So basically we're taking the, a blank through the whole digestion process, but with the spikes included for those four elements. And um, across the board, we met all the requirements that the SMPR um, set out for each of these different levels. And this is the um, spikes for the low, 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 medium and high levels. And this would be for the actual flower. This was for the cannabis product and we could meet all the spike requirements for recoveries and repeatabilities for this as well. And next is the oral. So this for, for this, we use the hemp butter and we met the requirements. And this is the topical. So this was the pain release cream and we met the requirements for this as well. And then the last category was the manufactured products and all the, all the requirements were met for this as well. And so that was a, that was a, a big study and um, that took a lot of work and Sam and I were both in the lab for a very long time to get that all done. Okay, one thing that I wanted to add that we have these capabilities uh, with this instrumentation is that we're able to do um, automated half mass correction. And that's important because um, doubly charged ions can appear at half their mass and these can, um, create errors in this type of analysis. And this is important because, again, we're looking at plant material. Plant material is grown in the ground, and in the ground there's rare earth elements. And one of the elements that is one of the main elements that we're looking for is arsenic, okay? And arsenic is monoisotopic. So a lot of, well, here, I always have the, this in my hand. 
So if you're not used to looking at the um, relative isotopic abundances of different elements, um, a lot of times when you're doing ICPMS, if something has an interference, you can just go ahead and look at a different isotope. But if you're looking for arsenic, there's only one isotope. That's why we call it monoisotopic. And it has this problem that um, when there's possibility for rare earth elements to be in the sample, this can be an issue because one of the rare earth elements is a samarium. And samarium has a mass of 150. And because it can easily lose its second ion, so it can be doubly charged, um, 150 over 2 would equal 75, which is right on the isotope for arsenic. So you can see where this could be a problem for our um, analysis in cannabis. And I've measured a lot of cannabis samples, and I definitely see rare earth elements in cannabis just because, again, it's grown in the ground. Okay, so with our software, um, we recently updated our, um, our software to this 5.1 Math Hunter, and we're now able to just by a click of a button be able to do corrections for those um, rare earth elements. Uh, interferences. So that's good. And we use that for this method, I should say. Another example would be for zinc. And zinc is one of those optional elements that a lot of people like to look for. And if a doubly charged interference would be from barium, which is also a possibility to be in cannabis samples. And you can see here, this is one of the um, cannabis flowers that we are looking at. And to just to confirm that um, barium was an issue, you can see I overlaid an isotopic template of what barium, uh, barium's isotopic template, and you can see that this would cause an interference on zinc to give um, false results. So we're aware of this. We have um, obviously these uh, rare earth element correction equations already automatic in our software, and they're easily just by a click of a button um, used. And so we're able to get around any of those interferences so we can get uh, correct results. Another feature. Um, Oh, no, this one is another example of looking at doubly charged interferences. Another one is for selenium, another element of interest for, for cannabis folks. And if you have um, uh, rare earth elements sh uh, shown here, they can also cause a, a problem for selenium. But again, we are aware of this and our method deals with this. And we have these uh, correction equations already set up um, in, in the method. Okay, another way that people like to use um, these isotopic templates is to actually confirm that some elements are in the sample. And in this case, I'm showing you an isotopic template overlay of mercury and lead. And you can see that if someone was looking for just, you know, one isotope of mercury, say 201, which is a common one that people look at, well, maybe if they just saw that one, they would want maybe more confirmation that mercury is actually there. Well, if you overlay the template, then you can uh, see that, you know, all the isotopes for mercury are there. So you can be um, confident in the data that you're, you're reporting. Okay. So in conclusion for our method, um, by using um, the 7850 and the microwave digestion, we're able to successfully analyze cannabis and its cannabis-derived products. Uh, we definitely utilize um, UHMI settings, so that ultra-high matrix introduction settings, settings, so that we're able to run a variety of different matrices. Um, and we're able to use that half-mass correction so that we can correctly uh, measure, you know, some of those elements that could have doubly charged interferences like zinc, selenium, and arsenic. And after working with the AOAC and the CAST panel, so that's the cannabis um, group at AOAC, we had three expert review meetings. Um, our metals and cannabis method was actually accepted as a first action status. So now it's actually official. It's a first action status for AOAC. And um, this was announced on August 3rd. And this is the OMA number. So this is the method number for AOAC. It's uh, 2021.03. And I believe it will be online through AOAC um, next uh, week, I think. So that's um, super helpful for the labs that are looking for some metals protocols in order to do their testing. All right. Okay. So now that we have the, well, let me back up. So now that we have the AOAC, I'm going to back up to the slide. Now that we have this the first action AOAC metals and cannabis method, um, we now have two years to complete an MLV, so a multi-lab validation study. And so we're going to be um, looking to get a bunch of labs to do that with us using our method. 
And we are going to be working with uh, NIST and some of their um, new SRMs that they're working on for cannabis. And so that's pretty exciting. And that's, a, that's going to be a pretty big undertaking. So we're um, excited to get into that after this method um, is released through AOAC. And Kyle, I'm going to reach out to you. Maybe you can uh, join our MLV that we're going to be running soon. Yeah, we'd love to be a part uh, of and so <laughs> Oh, good. And uh, maybe some other folks that are on the call as well, they would want to um, be a part of our MLV study. So that's for AOAC. Um, for ASTM, we are working on a method with them for metals and cannabis because we realize that, you know, not all labs follow AOAC and not all labs follow ASTM. So if we have a method, metals and cannabis method, with two different organizations because, you know, different folks, depending on where they are in the world and what type of industry they're in, they could need to follow um, different regulatory bodies and different uh, method, methods. So we are working with ASTM and we've written up a method for them and that will have to go to ballot. I'm not sure when, but that it goes through a similar process where it's voted on and, you know, we have corrections to do. We have to meet with experts and um, it's, it's quite an undertaking to get a method through one of these, um, one of these uh, bodies. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, but for ASTM method, we did include an MLV study already in our method for that. And so that was working with NIST and some of their soon to be released um, uh, standard reference materials. So that was pretty exciting. And um, the folks at NIST are always really nice to work with. So we were excited to be able to include that data for the ASTM um, method. So um, that's the end of my slides. So these are just some names and emails of folks that worked on this. So my uh, work colleague 